Hello, everybody. Hey, Dave. How are you, Ernesto? Getting ready for episode 47 I'm on board ready. day number 52. Let's change that to 52. There you go. Did you have to read it so slowly, or was that just part of a special effects package you just bought? What was that? Did you read it so slowly, deliberately, or was it a special effect that you used on your voice to make you modulate and sound more it was, the, it was the special effect. It was it my worked. Orson Welles. Very good. Whatever you call your Todd Jerry, if you call it Orson Welles, that's good. So anyway, here we are. I was walking my dogs, as I do every morning, listening to our podcasts to see if there's anything that I said which will lead me into a lot of trouble. Um, and I managed to get all the way around the block and get halfway through an episode because I slowed it all the way down, um, my walking. And it was really good. People don't realize we've got like how many episodes? It was like like 46 this episodes. This is 47 episodes. 47 oh episodes, thing. which uh, they are there on our uh, link there, bit.ly toilet paper podcast. Make sure to uh, subscribe because, of course, I mean, it's great to watch the show, but I know that... Uh, Especially right now that people are uh, starting to go out, they can take us with uh, with them and then have a good time while uh, learning and uh, finding out some of the cool news which are happening. So, what episode were you listening to? Uh, I don't know what number it was, um, but it was one where we we're having an argument about something, uh, and that was kind of cool as well. <laughs> and I was <laughs> that's, that's really rare. And I was I was telling I was going on for quite some time about how to reinvent your business. Um, I can't remember what the actual area was that I covered because um, I was just listening to myself thinking, this guy's quite smart, but I wish he'd stop talking so much. Um, and that's probably what people think when they listen anyway. But here's what I like about the fact this is 47th episode when you talk about podcasts. Normally, people will do a podcast not every day. We'll do it every week or sometimes even every couple of weeks. So it takes them a whole year to be able to build up best part of 50 different podcasts. By Friday, we'll have done 50. So we'll have caught up on everybody who's been doing podcasting for a year, and we'll start surpassing them. And then we're going to rule the podcasting world. Or That's going to be very cool, yeah. Yeah, yeah especially, right anyway. uh, especially uh, yeah, I mean, because every, every episode is uh, a little bit over an hour. Uh, well, a little bit less than an hour, because, of course, it's uh, it goes uh, edited, so... Once again, guys, if you are uh, listening right now, please make sure to uh, subscribe to our podcast. And also, if you just joined us, make sure that uh, you share uh, the uh, live episode uh, with uh, your groups, with other people, because we're going to be covering a lot of very interesting things about travel. But before we get started, I wait, have wait, to just say... Before you get started, about, before you get started, when I look down at my phone while you're talking, just to explain to people, what I've done is started a watch party on my page, which is Facebook backslash Dave Crane backslash. So if you join the watch party there and you ask questions, I can then produce them live and ask Mr. Ernesto, and he'll be able to answer them live. So how come you're so hot? How come your hair looks really, really interesting and windswept? And are those glasses, those Google glasses that they had before, because you look like you're a very tech kind of guy, All the, and why haven't you started shaving yet? All those questions we can share with you. Sorry, I interrupted. Your turn now. It's okay. I am uh, I'm starting to feel like this. Wow. So, well, if there's any consolation, I look like the right-hand one, and you look like the left-hand one. <laughs> <laughs> it's about right. So anyway, I uh, I want to wish everybody in uh, the United States, because this is an interesting holiday. This is uh, Cinco de Mayo, which basically means 5th of May, which is a time where the Mexicans defeated the French. It's hardly ever celebrated in Mexico. I mean, hardly anybody celebrates this uh, in Mexico. It is a holiday, but there's no celebration. What is but it? here in Mexico, here in the United States, they treat it like if it will be Independence Day, and everybody drinks margaritas, and everybody drinks uh, all sorts of Mexican uh, drinks, and uh, they celebrate with Mexican food. So uh, right now, I think we're going to be still. I mean, you can still go to some restaurants, but uh, anyway, we wish you and uh, I wish you, uh, Dave, happy Cinco de Mayo. Well, wait, stop, stop. I mean, I don't understand. What are you actually celebrating? Drinking tequila. Well, what happens is it is um, uh, it is a 
the original celebration happened in 1820. Well, the, the Mexicans defeated the French in Mexico. So that was the whole thing uh, about. So that's that's it's a battle. It's a battle of Puebla in Mexico. Right. But here in the United States, it is celebrated like if it will be independence, like like if it will be Fourth of July, and uh, they make a big party and they make a big uh, thing of it. And of course, it's an opportunity for marketing. So right now, you possibly look at your emails. Everybody's having uh, Cinco de Mayo offers and whatever it is. But it's just it's just a funny thing that I mean, it's just an opportunity to to uh, to get together and party. So Brenda right. Brenda McGuire is saying. Uh, happy Cinco de Mayo. So happy Cinco de Mayo to you too, Brenda. Thank you, Brenda. Great to see it as well. Great to see you. Very are. Fantastic. So uh, can I just check? So there might be drinking and there might be a little bit of debauchery. Do you think there will be social distancing or not? I hope it will. Of course, I mean, there's uh, there's right now uh, a few restaurants, but most, most people uh, definitely here at home, we're going to be eating Mexican food, but that's not... Uh, that's not uh, anything special. We eat Mexican food regularly with a lot of spices. So there you go. <laughs> and I can vouch for that. I've been in your house, and the toilet paper diaries is a perfect name. Yeah. So we're going to be talking about uh, a lot of uh, travel uh, stories here because uh, I think once again, uh, once again, one of the things that I recommended yesterday, and I recommend that you uh, also do it, is that you have a journal. Uh, because yes, indeed, I mean, as we are discovering right now what's going on in the world, and uh, even though it's going to be a little bit of uh, like it is here, I mean, this is us in quarantine, having a great time with the cat or the dog, and uh, we're going to be telling our grandchildren the stories of uh, what has happened while we were there on quarantine, and uh, it's important that we actually write them down. So we're going to be exploring the world together throughout this week. And on Friday, yes, on Friday, we are having our 50th episode, consecutive wow. episode. And we have already some amazing guests. Oh, yeah. So make, sure, no to, idea. make sure to be there. You have no idea how hard we've been working to connect with the biggest of the best names uh, to do this. So we can't say anything yet. It's a secret. So we told you we'd have to kill you. But we'll still let you know closer to the date. And you'll just go, oh, my goodness. How do you manage to do that? And it was mainly bribery, I think, and pictures that we can't talk about. <laughs> that is true. So today we're going to be talking once again as uh, exploring what's going to happen in the world. And, Gabe, and Dave is going to be giving us some ideas on how to use that uh, renaissance, as he says it. Oh, is it? Renaissance. 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 I said renaissance, but there's a renaissance. It doesn't matter. Potato, potato. Potato, potato, potato. So anyway, what you what uh, what uh, he's going to be telling you is how um, to get your job in the artistic way, and then I'm going to be sharing about some of the stuff that is going to happen in the travel industry. So we can get started, I think, with uh, with this slide, which I think it's exactly what's uh, what's going on. It mm -hmm. says that the uh, digital transformation. People have been talking about digital transformation and digital this and digital that for a long time. But still hasn't happened. And the funny thing is, right now, because of COVID-19, we have changed and gone digital. And uh, most of you are not 100% what that is going to mean. And that is just a, an, interesting, uh, an interesting perspective. So this is basically what I wanted to get this episode started with. You, are, you agree with this cartoon, right, Dave? I completely agree with that because we've been talking about at length the need for people to have reinvented themselves to be a more digital, a more uh, tech-savvy version of our existing business. And some people took it to heart and some people just couldn't be bothered because it, it was too much hard work. And you know what? It's scaremongering. I'll do it when I need to do it, which always seems strange to me because I would have thought looking after your job might be a reason to do it, but many people didn't. But now they have no choice. If you're not going outside and you're not online, how are you going to let people know what it is you do for a living? And if it's something that's physical, then they're not going to come to you. So all hands on deck. You have to play this game now. Yeah. You know, I was uh, watching yesterday and um, really interesting documentary about Ralph Nader. Now, for those of you which are not American and possibly Ralph Nader says nothing, Ralph Nader has been an activist uh, for a number of years. He's right now about 83 or 84 years old. And uh, he was, because of him, cars have... Um, 
secu uh, safety belts uh, because of him. Right now, cars are designed in such a way that uh, the the uh, cars are safe uh, because of him. Right now, uh, you know, there's no um, MSG in food, and he has really done a ton of stuff that I was completely unaware of. Incredibly interesting man. But one of the things that I like the most, and uh, this is basically how the ep how the documentary uh, finishes. Uh, basically, well, also if you know about what he did in in uh, the 2000 election. I mean, he it was because of him that uh, uh, that Al Gore didn't win on the election. So, but anyway, that's another story. But anyway, at the very end of the documentary, he mentions something which I think it's really, really true right now. Every single thing that you are doing shouldn't be for the Ernesto of today or for the Ernesto of yesterday. You have to do it for the Ernesto of tomorrow. And I think that's a very interesting concept that he mentions. He says, well, you know, right now, uh, I don't care what's going to happen. I'm basically going to be thinking on what I'm going to be doing so that the Ernesto from the future is going to really be benefiting because right now I really have no clue what I'm doing. I really have no clue in which terrain or in which direction I'm going. But my idea is to make sure that the Ernesto from the future has a better future or a better understanding on how things are working. So I I find it I find that angle fascinating because uh, obviously I mean you normally never think of yourself of the future. But of course, I mean, if you think, well, you know, everything I'm doing is to make sure that the Ernesto of the future has a better life, that of course makes you think in a complete different way. And that's why I, that's what I wanted to share. Well, I believe everything you tell me as one of my best friends, but this one I don't. I don't think he's ever said he does everything he wants to because of the Ernesto of the future. And I've not done anything for Ernesto of the future yesterday or well, the past. As you don't have to do anything for Ernesto of the future. That means that I am doing something for the Ernesto of the future. Oh, I am going right. for the, I am going for myself. What right. I'm doing right now is so that the Ernesto of the future has a better life. Because I was going to say, if you're that close to him and he's talking about Ernesto, why have we got him on the 50th show? I am talking about... <laughs> We just joke a lot. Anyway, I get it. I get it. And I think you're absolutely right. And I think everybody needs to think about that as well, because the way that people view the world is really interesting. When you do NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, you can get people to do an exercise where you get them to close their eyes and point at where the, the past is and point at where the future is. So some people will close their eyes and will go like that behind them from the past and that for the future, which means that they're in the center of their world. Sometimes they do it slightly to the side. So that's where the past is. That's the future. So they never feel that they're really in their own timeline. Some people put it from side to side. So they're never moving forward. The past and the future feels the same way. And often you get it the wrong way around. So the, the past is in front of them and the future is behind. And that way they're never able to move forward in their lives because all they see is the things in front of them that they haven't got over from the past. And it's a very interesting exercise because you can physically move their hands around and change yeah. their experience of where they're going with their lives. Because many people can't move forward because they're just carrying so much rubbish from the past that they've got to get over. And you know you can't change the past. You can just change your relationship with it. So I find that yeah. fascinating. So there I'm, very, I'm very aware of how everything works there in, uh, on, on the NLP part. But, I mean, once again, it is, I've never projected myself as doing stuff for the Ernesto of the future. So mm -hmm. I always thought, well, you know, I know in the, the, the future in that side, the, the past in that side, and then you put it around. So, I mean, I, I am I'm familiar with what with those things, but what for me is in, quite interesting is actually say, well, who are you working for? Are you working for the Ernesto on the present? I mean, for the person on the present, so it doesn't no, get you. <laughs> me, me, the you me, of the present, me, 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 for the me, for the, uh, for the me, and I think that's the entire uh, than the entire point we're seeing here, Pete uh, Pete Garcia, that he's ready for three margaritas. So uh, happy Cinco de Mayo, Pete! <laughs> I'm surprised he's only had three. But yeah, well, it's too early. It's too early. So I'm I'm definitely going to be having some uh, good margaritas. Anyway, let's just, uh, Can I just stop say, wait, 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 wait. I want to just rewind on what you just said hey, there. I've got the same thing, but I do it for my daughter in the future, not me. Okay. And I've always done it like that. 
Yeah, that's very nice. That's very nice. Yeah, indeed. I mean, whatever whatever motivates you. But I mean, the whole point is we're entering into a complete new world. And uh, we're entering into, into a world that is completely unknown uh, to us. And uh, especially right now, for example, one of the things that we know that things are changing dramatically. This is a video that uh, I got from, uh, from uh, here from Texas when the, the restaurants just opened. Look at how restaurants are going to be uh, operating right now so that you can see that we are in a complete different uh, uh, different world, entering a complete different world. Have a look. Now, we're just two days away from restaurants reopening in Texas. to take your family out to eat. Stephanie Whitfield says be prepared for things to look a bit different. For the last several weeks, restaurants have been trying to stay afloat with takeout and delivery orders only. But that changes Friday. Restaurants can reopen if they follow safety protocols mandated by Governor Greg Abbott. First, businesses can only operate at 25% capacity. Valet will only be offered for vehicles with handicap placards or plates. In the restaurant, there should be a hand sanitizer station at the entrance. It's also recommended an employee man the door to limit touching door handles. There must be six feet between every party. That includes while waiting to be seated and no parties of more than six are allowed. Customers will only get disposable menus and tables should be disinfected between every group. There's a separate safety checklist for restaurant staff. All should be trained in proper hygiene and disinfecting techniques. They should wash their hands regularly, social distance when possible, and masks are recommended, but not required. Staff should be screened for symptoms of the coronavirus before work daily. If someone gets COVID-19, they can't come back until three days after they've recovered. If an employee is around someone who tests positive, they should stay home for two weeks. If coronavirus cases are contained for the next few weeks, businesses will move on to phase two of the plan to reopen Texas. That'll increase capacity to 50%. Stephanie Whitfield, KHOU, 11 News. Interesting. I, I feel that... I've got my thoughts about it. I think if you're going to do it, that's the right way to do it. But my worry is, and I'm not getting into politics, do you have adequate testing for everybody daily in every shop, every restaurant, every part of the world where people are coming into contact? How do you get them tested? Are they doing it themselves or going and get a proper test done? And when do you get the results back? Three days later? Just a thought. That's all. Yeah, it's true. Well, that's what I'm saying. I mean, it's a complete different world. And if you think about it also... Uh, if we go into travel, yesterday, uh, uh, Pete Garcia also provided us with a really interesting video of what uh, United Airlines is doing. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, I think it's great, but this is going to actually change the model of aviation because right now the turnaround of uh, the flights uh, is going to be uh, a lot longer because, of course, doing this every time is going to be difficult. Uh, right now, they declared American Airlines and United that uh, every flight that you have to be wearing a mask. Maybe Here, we go. Tell you something. Here we go. I'm John Reutman, Senior Vice President of Airport and Network Operations for United Airlines. Safety is our number one priority at United, and we understand that now more than ever, customers want to know what we're doing to keep our aircraft clean. Here's what you should know. Our aircraft at United are clean before every flight, and each and every day we thoroughly wipe down all high-touch areas with a high-grade disinfectant and multi-purpose cleaner. This includes areas such as lavatories, galleys, tray tables, inside and out of overhead bins, window shades, armrests, and in-seat video screens. You should also know that many of our aircraft are equipped with HEPA filters state-of-the-art air circulation systems similar to those used in hospitals. This means a high-efficiency filter removes up to 99.97% of airborne particles inside the plane. And we'll be using an electrostatic sprayer to disinfect air and surfaces within the cabin, starting with international arrivals into our U.S. hubs. And when the CDC determines that someone with a confirmed case of COVID-19 has traveled on one of our planes, that aircraft will be immediately taken out of service and sent through a rigorous decontamination process, including washing ceilings and fully scrubbing the cabin interior. Once again, 
your safety is our absolute top priority. For more information on the steps we're taking to protect your family and ours, please visit united.com slash coronavirus. And as always, thanks for flying United. Very interesting. Very interesting. I wish we'd sort out a teleprompter and tell him who to look at when he's talking because you get looking at the words and looking at the camera, looking at the, put the words on the camera and then it won't look so weird when he's looking away. But it's fascinating to see the lengths that we're going to to rescue the airline industry. And when what what figure did you say they're losing every day? Billions or something, isn't it? Crazy numbers. Yeah, it's uh, it's insane how much they are how much they are losing. I mean, uh, uh, Pete was uh, um, also sharing on the um, on on the show that we're also doing together about the preparing to unmask. That recently, I think Delta for the first time had the the uh, same amount of sales that they had as refunds. I mean, I, the the airline industry is going to really face a very very sad uh, few years i think it's it's going to be very difficult to to recover i have another video which is actually will like, will take it a little bit further so that we can see hotels and uh and other uh, and other things which are also hospitality yeah let's just have a look things will never be the same but it's not all bad welcome to mojo travels and today we're discussing what travel will look like in a post-pandemic world are you a fan of our videos? Be sure to subscribe to Mojo Travels and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. For this list, we're looking at how the travel industry, travel trends, and our relationship to travel overall will be changed by the pandemic that struck in 2020. No one can predict what the future will hold with 100% accuracy, but these are some of the key points that experts raise. Trip insurance will be a big priority. When most people shop for travel insurance, they usually seek out the cheapest option available. The logic is that you're extremely unlikely to need to use it. But as many people learned the hard way, when faced with an outbreak, a cheap safety net quickly disappoints. In the post-pandemic world, we expect to see a rise in cancel for any reason insurance, one of the few options that actually covers pandemics. Travelers will also likely be far more discerning about the provider they go with paying close attention to the specifics of the policies, and opting to shell out more money for better protection. Discounts will be a large part of the recovery effort. The pandemic that hit in 2020 as it pertains to travel is unprecedented. Comparable outbreaks haven't been experienced on this scale since before we became such a globally mobile population. In the wake of 9-11, airlines responded by dropping their fares to counteract the fear of flying with rock-bottom deals. Given how far-reaching the effects of this pandemic have been, we can expect discounted rates across all aspects of the travel industry, from hotels and all-inclusives to theme parks. That being said, experts recommend looking for deals from reputable providers who offer the most value rather than the cheapest prices, as the pandemic has reminded us that discount carriers can easily fold and provide little customer protection. Cruise lines will face a drawn-out battle. While airlines will recover from the fallout of the pandemic, cruise ships will likely be in troubled waters for an extended period of time. Some of them might not make it out. Unfortunately, the nature of cruise ships is such that they are especially vulnerable to viral outbreaks. For this reason, travelers are going to be far more wary to sign up for this type of travel, not only due to the increased risk of transmission, but also because of how extremely unpleasant it is to be quarantined at sea in the event of a widespread outbreak. For the cruise lines that do survive, however, we may see them making drastic changes to their infrastructure in order to prepare for such events in the future, including dedicated quarantine sections of the ship. Countries least affected will be the most desirable destinations. The early days of renewed travel will likely see people being incredibly discerning about where they choose to visit. Among the first international destinations to attract visitors will be those that were least affected by the pandemic, or those that recovered the most quickly and have most successfully returned local life to its status quo. This could see the rise of new and unexpected IT destinations. Here's the thing though, while these are the countries where people will most want to visit, given the correlation between international arrivals and transmission, closed borders and travel bans could impede such trips. A comeback for domestic travel. When we travel abroad, we inherently place ourselves in a more vulnerable position. When you're not a citizen of a country and international borders separate you from home, a crisis becomes twice as stressful. Add to that nations being hesitant about welcoming international visitors, and all signs point to domestic travel being the first type of trip people take. 
pre-pandemic, relatively inexpensive flights had us traveling further and more frequently than ever before. But according to a Luggage Hero survey, 21% of American travelers plan to opt to keep their first trips in-country in the immediate wake of the pandemic. This is clearly going to be a huge trend. Minimal contact travel will be the starting point. People might feel comfortable traveling within their own borders, but don't expect them to be flocking to major cities anytime soon. Considering how hard New York City's been hit and the social distancing training we've all undergone, travelers are likely to remain wary of large crowds for the foreseeable future. As such, the earliest trips that people are most likely to take will be to remote and sparsely populated areas. Camping, day trips, national parks, boutique hotels in small towns, these are the sort of baby steps that travelers will be taking as they rebuild their confidence about venturing beyond home. And because so much time is spent indoors during a pandemic, we also expect nature to be a big draw in general. The duration of trips will change. This is one area in which the experts are divided. Some argue that because of the financial impact of the pandemic, travelers won't be able to journey as long as they previously did. Under this logic, the two-week holiday is more likely to be cut down to one week. There's also a vulnerability factor. Travelers are likely to feel a bit ill at ease during their first trip or two post-pandemic. Shorter trips will almost serve as a reconditioning of sorts. By contrast, others are predicting that people will favor long-term stays over the frequent short trips that have become all the rage in recent years. The logic? Less time spent on planes and at high-risk places like airports. People will still want to travel. For all the fears and anxieties pertaining to travel that arise from a global pandemic, the reality is that the desire to see the world is stronger. For many, travel is and will remain a major priority and an essential tool for self-discovery and self-care. Yes, travel may be more difficult moving forward, including stricter borders and a greater preoccupation with traveler health, culminating in less freedom of movement on the global scale. But travel is an important economic driver and an extremely enriching cultural experience, and those factors will ultimately overpower our collective concerns. Even major tourist destination cities that have been hit hard like New York City, Rome, and Paris will recover with time. In the end, our wanderlust will win out, and hopefully the lessons learned during this pandemic will make us better travelers. Check out this other recent clip from Mojo Travel. Well, wow. crazy, yeah. What's your thoughts then? Which way are you going? Are you going for long trips or for short trips? What do you think? It's hard to say. I mean, we're having a, we're having a lot of uh, interesting comments from here. See, mm. for example, we're getting uh, uh, Munir. Munir is telling us just like in 9-11, uh, charge security process prior to travel. This will change how we also uh, get to travel. I think we're going to be have the temperature checked. You know what my biggest fear is on this one? That uh, I mean, and this is this might be also falling into the uh, conspiracy theory uh, kind of thing. But what if suddenly they tell us, well, you know, I mean, if you are not, if you don't have a vaccination and you don't have a, you cannot travel. Or if you don't have this kind of thing, you cannot travel. So that basically goes into restricting the the uh, the travel possibility. So those are things that I don't understand. I think um, the worst yeah. one of that is if you can't travel back because you're in a country where they've changed the rules and you're not allowed to get back on a plane. That's when it starts becoming a major worry, which many people had to experience this year as well. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Ty, Ty Cohen is saying um, humans are... Uh, Habitual, forgiving, and forgetful, and uh, there. But what is the the whole thing? He just invested twenty thousand dollars in various airline stocks as a as a, um, a long play term. Uh, yeah, he says. And I, we have here also on the other side, Pete Garcia is telling us that Warren Buffett just unloaded all his U.S. airline stocks. Uh, Brenda McQuarrie saying, I heard today Carnival will begin doing cruises again after August first. I would like to know your thoughts. Well, I mean, I, I was just watching, you know, that uh, fast forward uh, moving on the cruise. I mean, I don't know about you, but I... <laughs> I'm not in a hurry. I've only been on one cruise. It was Internet Marketers Cruise, and I shared a cabin with you probably about 15 or so years ago. And it was already, we were too close anyway um, for, for, for comfort. To be, we weren't sharing a bed. That would be hideous. Um, but it was just too close. The idea of being stuck in there with one of us having COVID or even one of us snoring, forget it. I'll just wave at you as you go off on your boat. I'm not interested. <laughs> Pete, uh, Pete Garcia is also saying here, don't buy stock of Carnival yet. It will take longer for the cruises to come back. 
Uh, remember also they have the norovirus. Uh, also, uh, the island destinations would not really like to let them to knock uh, to dock any time. But the problem also with the island destinations is they leave out of the cruises. So of course, they want the cruises back. So it's a, it's a really weird uh, situation that we're in. A Thai it, saying, uh, if you don't take, if you don't need the money, you can afford to stick for another five years. This will be a this will be a very uh, very good thing. Yeah, it's true. Mm. Uh, my goodness, well, we, have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of comments. Mundi In fact, the, the, comments are, the comments are more interesting than we are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, I mean, I, I have to say that uh, I also love traveling. Uh, and uh, I hope that uh, things will go back to, to as normal as we possibly can. I know that things are going to change. But I have the feeling that, uh, yeah, it's going to be a lot of hesitancy to change. Because there's many uncertain factors. I mean, after 9-11, there were not really that many uncertain factors. But right now, there's a lot of uncertain factors. There's also so, the fact, uh, Ernesto, that there will be, if it's not already created, but of course it must be an index of the countries that responded with the best results. The governments that took charge, did the social distancing early, did the testing, did all the rest of it, they're the ones that people are going to want to flock to. So New Zealand got rid of it pretty much straight away. Iceland did very well out of it. Japan did very well out of it. Um, Sweden and Denmark, Germany got straight on the ball as well. Those are the countries that are going to benefit because people want to go and visit them. So their tourism will be booming. Um, as yeah, a but, but then again, that. let's say that you're Germany, like yeah. what happened in Japan which I think mm -hmm. is really crazy. Let's say that you're Germany. Oh my goodness, I have really done the whole thing. Do I want people from all over the world that I have no control over to actually come and visit my country? That's true you see, well. those, those are the Those are the very weird things. I mean, right now, apparently Japan has actually canceled, definitely canceled the Olympics. In fact, I am actually very, very happy that uh, I heard that uh, Dubai has now new dates for the Expo. So they are, yes. they are a lot more positive in in in, uh, in their thinking so you know this is this is the reason why we are exploring this together with you and of course i mean we love all your all your comments because we are trying to figure out where we're gonna go do we have answers no but what we are doing is we are basically presenting things and trying to understand the world in a better way this is the way that we're actually having the renaissance Absolutely. It's very interesting because we've watched this evolve over the last 50 odd days um, from, oh my goodness, uh, is this real? Is this really happening? To um, literally, it was, a, I mean, we said that from business's point of view, it'd be a shutdown. Everyone's going to shut down for about six weeks and then we'll start seeing them coming out of it. But this is a much higher level. On every level, every country is, is being examined and watched to see what decision was made. If the politicians told the truth, if the politicians took swift action, if they invested in ventilators and testing equipment, if they um, got the extra hospitals out, if they looked after their, their medical staff, and uh, all these things are really important, not just because of fighting the virus and saving lives, but because every single country is looking at you now to see whether they want to spend money with you because of your response. And a large part of that was down to the empathy as well as the finances. If you did the right thing for your people right now, you're seeing the benefits because people are, are respecting you because of the decisions that you took. Yeah. You know, another another aspect that I am incredibly interested in is actually trying to find out what's going to be the response uh, for China. Uh, right now, we can see already there's a global black uh, backlash building against China over the coronavirus. I mean, wherever you go on the... Uh, news, if you go to social media, they're blaming the Chinese for all sorts of things. Now, I mean, it's it's uh, difficult to say because we are unaware of what has happened. But I think one of the things that we need to understand is the uh, economical aspects of what is basically what China has been doing. So I have an interesting video which is going to make you think a lot about, uh, about this topic. So have a look. Hi. What you see here is $10,000 on the table. You can take this money as a loan, but I will charge you a little bit of interest rate. Like most people, you take the money and you go buy a nice car. But in 10 years, it's time to pay me back. And because of interest rates, now you owe me $20,000 and not 10. You will say, I don't have money to give you. And if you don't, I take your car and a piece of your house. Damn. 
This is how death works. And after three years of traveling the world, I noticed that this is exactly what China is doing. For example, take the small island nation of Sri Lanka. This developing country needs money and China has a lot of it. So Sri Lanka took billions of dollars in Chinese loans. It was easy money just there to be taken. And with that, they built skyscrapers, highways, airports, and shipping ports. The country grew and prospered. But few years later, this easy money came with interest rates, and Sri Lanka was so much in debt that it couldn't pay back China its money. And the only way out was to give China control of what they had built. In other words, Sri Lanka lost a piece of its home to China because of debt. This is the Chinese money trap. And it's a real thing I saw all over the world. In Papua New Guinea, I saw $2 billion in loans given by the Chinese to build skyscrapers, infrastructures and ports. But there is no way this remote developing country can pay it back or its interest rate. And the only way out is to give China control of the country. In the Maldives, Pakistan, Malaysia, Laos, Kazakhstan, Mongolia, Egypt, Kenya, and South Africa, the same thing is happening, and many countries are struggling to pay back Chinese loans. If you look closely, all these infrastructure projects like highways, ports, and bridges connect to China through the sea or through the land to form something far bigger, far more powerful, than just a bridge, a new Silk Road. The world is already made by China and I think slowly it will be owned by China. Don't get me wrong, building bridges, ports, highways and airports is a great thing for the people in the country. But they come at a very high cost. And when these countries can't pay back the loans, these countries will lose their homes. One thing my parents had taught me is that there's no such thing as a free lunch or a free ride. So if we're not careful with our money or other people's money, then we better start learning Chinese. I knew about this stuff anyway. I saw, I saw um, a documentary all about uh, Chinese investment in Africa doing the same thing. Uh, and so naturally, when it comes to making decisions with the United Nations and so on, Africa will vote in the direction that China decides is going to be because they've invented, they've invested so much money into the infrastructure. And this is, I want to make a point of this. This is not beating China. I promise you this is not. This is just an observation about a political decision that's being made um, by many organizations um, and to see what the political situation will be in a few years' time when the loans start coming back in. So I want to say that for all our Chinese friends. I'm not bashing and we're not planning to do it as a bash anyway. Yeah, that's not the idea. I mean, we don't we don't want to, uh, to, to pick on anyone, but I think it's just interesting how it is. I mean, we're basically putting everything for your uh, for your own uh investigation for your own curiosity and yeah it's just crazy uh, we're uh, we're seeing some some uh, points here from brenda that she says that she was actually going to the olympics uh but i mean she has no clue if she's going to be getting any refunds for airbnb or the olympic committee or the airlines or what's going to be happening yeah insurance that's going to be also let's see how they're going to be playing uh, playing that uh, that story. Now, moving to the other part, which I think is also very uh, interesting, is we need to see a little bit the how we're going to be crafting our job. How are we going to be presenting our wealth uh, ourselves to the world? So we've been already talking about all these travel things, which I think all I have done over here is not giving you um, the answers because I don't have the answers or we don't have the answers, but more than anything, make you think of how things are going to be uh, working in the future. Dave, we would love to know a little bit about the artistic part, the right brain. So I went a little bit to the left brain, to the logistic, uh, to the uh, logical brain. Now let's go to the creative brain. I'd love to do that. I know I'm going to show a video in a moment, which is something I created. Um, and I started making music videos with a spoken word because I wanted to start playing with the idea of creating art. 
an art form that would fit out for, for creating content that people would find viral, people might be interested in, and also it satisfied an ex-DJ about an area that I've never really experimented with, but I wanted to go further in. We're gonna show the video in a few moments, but I want you to think about it from a couple of different points of view. The video is called Haters and Trolls. And when I say the word F, it means forget and not anything rude at all. But also, it's based on the idea that you shouldn't be scared to do what you need to do to be able to get out there. Now, right now, we're talking about art, but the whole context is very much about whatever business you're in, position yourself as an artist in it. So therefore, if you're doing a job that's very normal, like say you're, say you're a mechanic working on cars, how could you create art out of that? Well, look at the amount of shows about restoring cars, the amount of shows about how to fix cars. Could you do something like that and share it with people as a video, an instructional video, showing how to give, do the tools or do it yourself? How can you create art out of that? So I want to share this video, and then after that, give you five tips of how you can reinvent yourself and get your mindset right to be able to do this kind of thing for yourself in your own world. So this one's called Hated cool. and Trolls. I hope you enjoy it. Very cool. It's really valid, but it's not. It only matters if you can use it and turn your business into a more successful way to look after yourself, your friends, your family, your holidays, the people that you truly care about. Everything else is just other people's opinion. And someone decided it was a good idea to tell you how to be small. F those people. Be as big as you can be, as big as you want to be, because it's none of their darn business. You're never going to get everybody to like you. At school you didn't. But here's the thing, 50% of the person you are was probably formed in the school playground and not in the educational forum where you studied and worked really hard to get your exams. Your ability to get on with people, your ability to learn to learn, to network, to sell, to create relationships is what's creating the you right now. Think about your fame, think about your connections, think about your brand, think about some of the biggest names in the world. It doesn't matter how popular you are, there's always someone, somewhere, who hates your guts, who hates the way you talk, hates the way you walk, and hates the fact that you breathe. F them as well. You get paid for two things. The effect of a job you do, and how cheaply you can get replaced by somebody else. If you want to be found, you've got to create a brand. If you want to get paid, you got to start going out on a limb as an artist and creating stuff that nobody else is creating in the market. So there we go. I love these videos. They're really Thank cool. You. We've got some mad ones that you and I have done together, which is very cool. You started me off with this when we were just experimenting in Houston. And I said, just hold a camera and let me just talk. And there we go. So that video, by the way, just for, for, for the knowledge sake, was done in one take with my phone in my hand outside my daughter's school while she was going to swimming lessons. I thought I'll just record something because something was in my head. Now, I want to talk to you about the mindset that goes behind doing something like that. You might want to do something like this or you might have something in your, your mind that you've wanted to do for a long time. And I want to push you to start doing it because there's a couple of different factors. Now, I got the inspiration for making that video. I'm, I've done a whole lot of videos like that from reading Seth Godin's book, The Icarus Deception, all about the legendary story of Icarus, who made some wings with feathers and, um, and wax. So he tried to fly away to escape. If he goes too close to the sun, the, the wax would melt and he falls into the sea, too close to the sea, and the salt would ruin his wings and he'd crash as well. So he had to go halfway between. And you've got to do this with your abilities. So first point, there's five points. Be scared of not pushing yourself enough. Be scared of not pushing yourself until you are completely empty of energy, creativity, and courage. You want to feel depleted. You don't want to go halfway. You don't want to do it saying people are going to say bad things about this. Because if you do that, you'll never really create art. What you'll actually create is what other people want to see, which they don't want to see because they've never had your art before. And you'll end up doing a mild version that nobody will care about. Number two, forget everything that they taught you at school. Schools are factories that produce people who conform. And that used to guarantee a job. Right now, as everybody's found out, 30 million people in the US, that job is not guaranteed. But all around the world, this is going to be an ongoing thing. So big rewards for conforming, you know, getting great rewards because you got the marks right when you were told to do it a certain way and being shamed for being an underachiever and even abused 
for refusing to play the game of schools and so on. That abuse, that refusing to play the game is the one thing that you need right now, that ability to turn and take a step back Look at the world around you and say, I don't want to play this game. I'm not guaranteed a job. I don't want to apply like everybody else. What if I did something different with my natural talents, my natural interest? Could I turn this into something? That's something you were never meant to think like at school, but now it's the best way to move forward. Number three, stop seeking mass approval. If people don't like it, they can kiss it. Seriously. Ask a handful of people, get their opinion, put it into a bag, shake the bag in your mind and take out the stuff that's useful for you. Don't take out all the sentiments, the emotions and all that other stuff unless it drives you to be more experimental. We never get anywhere by trying to please everybody. And the way the industry works is about finding solutions. Now, when the solution of something is on a mass appeal, then it also blocks new things coming through. When new things come through, they get shamed and made to look stupid because people like to protect the, the status quo. So don't think about it like that. Go out and do it anyway for an audience of one person. If you do it for you, some things will work, some things won't work, but that will work for you long term because you've got to get it out of your system at the very least. Number four, think about what you need to do before you die. Yes, I'm going that extreme. Because if you leave it and leave it and it burns a little hole and you let it go and you let all the other things mount up, like, you know, doing the dishes and, and, and going to work and doing the work that somebody's told you to do on a weekend, you've got to do some extra stuff to file for the cupboard, for the whatever it is, you'll never get around to that bit where you feed yourself to come up with creativity. And we all value artists who really do change the world. Right now, the only people that are changing the world are the billionaires because they can afford to. And they've got factories and resources to be able to come up with an idea and make it happen. Well, right now, you can change that. You can come up with your ideas and shake the world just by following your heart and doing what you believe is right. And the last point I want to share with you is this. Mess up as often as you can, but learn as you do it. The first few videos I made were pretty bad really bad but then i got it got easier and then i found new ways of putting captions on and adding visuals and so on to the point where i thought you know what i'm okay i'll stop doing this for a little while but i will return as you do stuff you will feel ridiculous you will feel scared you'll be worried about others other people's approval and that's exactly why you have to keep pushing become an artist in your business not just in your art but turn art around the way that you think about the world because right now with the internet you can reach out to eight billion people and someone somewhere will buy what you're suggesting so go for it love it i think it's uh, absolutely great advice i love at uh, the very end of the video of saying well you know go break some eggs and uh, start uh, doing some omelets <laughs> And uh, I think that's exactly the way that we have to think about uh, stuff. I mean, right now, it's uh, it's great. Uh, exactly what has happened with this show. I mean, we started in exactly. really knowing exactly which direction we were going. And little by little, it's just action, which is absolutely required. I mean, it's just a, a matter of, of finding out. And right now, you have the opportunity of starting with a blank canvas because we're entering into a new uh, entire new world. Dave, believe it or not, we are getting to the end of the show. Can you believe oh it? Oh my goodness. Yeah, well, time runs fast when I'm talking a lot. But what a show. We've covered so many areas of hospitality, flights, travels, holidays, restaurants. Um, the only thing we didn't cover is fashion. Are we going to save that for tomorrow? I think we're going to save that for tomorrow because uh, there's uh, uh, this episode specifically was called the great realization and uh it was actually the second step okay life after uh life after lockdown and right now the great realization is that uh this world now has gone completely different and i i know that the consciousness is there because this video that i'm going to show you and i'm sure that you have already seen it but remember this is a toilet paper diaries and it's a diary it's a journal and uh, I wanted to make sure that this actually belongs in the journal, not because it was the most viewed vi uh, um, video uh, in the past week, but uh, because I think it will really create the beginning of how we're going to start thinking on consciousness. Right now, this video is completely creating a new level of consciousness, and it's explained there. I'm sure that you have seen it. And with that, we'll just come quickly out and then uh, we'll, uh, we'll finish the show. Have a look.
Yes, then I'll go to bed. But my boy, you're growing weary, sleepy thoughts about your head. Please, that one's my favourite. I promise just once more. <laughs> okay, snuggle down, my boy, though I know you know full well. The story starts before then, in a world I once would dwell. It was a world of waste and wonder, of poverty and plenty, back before we understood why hindsight's twenty twenty. You see, the people came up with companies to trade across all lands, but they swelled and got much bigger than we ever could have planned. We'd always had our wants, but now it got so quick, you could have anything you dreamed of in a day, and with a click. We noticed families had stopped talking, that's not to say they never spoke, but the meaning must have melted and the work-life balance broke, and the children's eyes grew square and every toddler had a phone. They filtered out the imperfections, but amidst the noise, they felt alone. And every day the skies grew thicker, till you couldn't see the stars. So we flew in planes to find them, while down below, we filled our cars. We'd drive around all day in circles. We'd forgotten how to run. We swapped the grass for tarmac, shrunk the parks till there were none. We filled the sea with plastic, because our waste was never capped, until each day when you went fishing you'd pull them out, already wrapped. And while we drank and smoked and gambled, our leaders taught us why. It's best to not upset the lobbies, more convenient to die. But then in 2020, a new virus came our way. The governments reacted and told us all to hide away. While we all were hidden, amidst the fear, and all the while, the people dusted off their instincts. They remembered how to smile. They started clapping to say thank you, and calling up their mums. And while the car keys gathered dust, they would look forward to their runs. And with the skies less full of voyagers, the earth began to breathe, and the beaches bore new wildlife that scuttled off into the seas. Some people started dancing. Some were singing, some were baking. We'd grown so used to bad news, but some good news was in the making. And so when we found the cure, and were allowed to go outside, we all preferred the world we found to the one we'd left behind. Old habits became extinct, and they made way for the new. And every simple act of kindness was now given its due. But why did it take a virus to bring the people back together? Well, sometimes you've got to get sick, my boy, before you start feeling better. Now lie down and dream of tomorrow and all the things that we can do. And who knows, if you dream hard enough, maybe some of them will come true. We now call it the Great Realisation. And yes, since then there have been many. But that's the story of how it started and why hindsight's twenty twenty. Really, yeah, really, really effective. Yeah, I love it. And I have to say, I've thought about that for many, many days. But one of the things that comes to me is if my dad was telling me stories like that before I went to bed, I would never have got any sleep. It would have freaked <laughs> me out. But the sentiment <laughs> is still beautiful. So thanks for sharing. Enjoy your sleep, kids. See you tomorrow. I'll do the same thing tomorrow. Sit here on my butt and eat a churro. That seems fun. I've got seven zooms tomorrow. They'll say words like circle back and cash flow to everyone. All my kids want to play all day. I'm working and we made the same mess. 